Number 10, the end of an era. 1914, a super important dude in Sarajevo got capped in the back of his convertible. Some people are super cool about this, and others are not so super cool about this. So uncool in fact that they want to try out all the new fancy weapons and gadgets from the state of the art technology that they've been stockpiling for years. The Ottomans seeing that their empire was in a decline saw an opportunity to solidify their place in Europe, strengthen their empire and maybe just take some stuff from weaker countries. I hear Arabia has lovely sand and oil this time of year. So, how do we achieve victory, some Ottomans thought to themselves. It makes most sense to really join the stronger side, so that way we can almost guarantee our victory and be sitting at the right end of the negotiation table. Germany, Austria, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire would form the Central Powers during the First World War. It went very well for the Central Powers for about 5 minutes before the whole thing went cow otters up. Germany was bogged down in the east and the west, Austria was having a difficult time with the Russians, the Ottoman Empire learned that building railways through someone else's country to take their stuff isn't very cool. When the smoke settled, the once mighty and powerful Ottoman Empire dissolved. Hundreds of years of great wealth and conquest gone within a few short years after World War I had ended. It's almost as if they shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place. Number 9 Execute Order 66 When you get big like the Ottoman Empire, you need protection. You need something that's really gonna protect you. The United States has the Navy SEALs, the British has the Special Air Service. And I have a collection of 80s movies that's so nerdy it protects me and chases off any cute girl who comes near me. But the Ottomans were thinking ahead by introducing the Janissary Corps, a unit of elite troopers who were the first modern standing army in Europe. Paid regular salaries, disciplined, and was one of the first militaries to have extensive use of firearms. Completely loyal to the Sultan, the Janissaries were a formidable fighting force. What happened to the Janissaries I hear my bumblebees asking? Well, it's not so nice. A messy political climate was going to disband the Corps. Not liking the replacements coming in after the Janissaries, they revolted. Which led to something known as the Auspicious Incident, where the barracks burnt down and 4,000 Janissaries lost their lives. Any remaining Jedi were hunted down and destroyed. Sorry, I meant Janissaries. Watch too much Star Wars in preparation for Boba Fett. All jokes aside, that was pretty cruel. You shouldn't, you shouldn't burn people down like that, man. Not so cool. But the comparison between the two, it's there. Star Wars, uh, Star Wars is cool. Number eight. Where art thou, brother? Kings will be kings, and the male patriarchy will be the male patriarchy. You want your dynasty to continue? Then you need a male heir. Like most European kingdoms, this is just how it goes. The Ottomans were no different. Except maybe their version of the royal family game. See, the Ottomans like to compete for the throne. Meaning, if you got brothers, you're gonna have to fight them for it. But not like the fight over the Xbox controller, no. These brothers would be fighting for life or death. Oftentimes in having a lot of bloodshed in order to determine the next ruler. In one extreme case, one Sultan had his infant brother strangled to make sure his spot on the throne was secured. Which is totally a normal human, kind loving thing to do. I'm happy to say we no longer do this. Number 7. Sisyphus and Hades Sisyphus was the first king of Ephra. A cruel king. He killed guests and travelers in his palace, which was a violation of guest obligations, which fell under Zeus's domain, thus angering him. He took pleasure in these killings because they allowed him to maintain his iron fist rule. Zeus was really pissed, yeah. This guy was cocky, and he punished him for cheating death twice. But his younger brother, Hades, caught wind of this and was like, no, 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 no. As a punishment for this trickery, Hades made Sisyphus roll a huge boulder endlessly up a steep hill. Forever. Yeah, he was like, no, 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 Zeus, I got this one. Brothers helping brothers. Hades then displayed his own cleverness by enchanting the boulder to rolling away from Sisyphus right before he reached the top, resulting in an eternity of getting jacked quads and hammies, and an eternity of uselessly, effortlessly, and unending frustration. Yeah, that's really annoying. Number six. Hera and Io. Okay, so we're moving away from kind of firm but fair and non-lethals to a little bit more and more cruel. Io was a beautiful woman to whom Zeus fell in love with, a married man. Ugh. Io was the daughter of Inachus, one of the river gods and king of Argos. She was living in Argos when Hera learned about this secret relationship. And she was a little hurt. I mean, who wouldn't be? Stewing in her sinister revenge, Hera turned Io into a cow to keep her away from her husband. You know, pretty non-lethal. Very mean, but, you know, fair. After being cheated on again by the same woman, she was like, alright, I guess that didn't work. And Hera was like, I'm done. 
She then sent a giant gadfly to sting Io continuously in cow form until she ran away, mad cow style, wandering from country to country, always being stung. Okay, I get this. You want to stop hanging around my man? You get stung every time. Okay? Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs> Number five. Hera and Heracles. Bless my soul, Herc was on a roll, and Hera, the queen of gods, was extremely jealous of that. All those other women in her husband's life. Zeus's consorts, and Hera hated the kids that came along with the adultery. One of them being, of course, Heracles, who puts the glad in gladiator, Hercules. Yeah, that's the same dude. I was a 90s kid. As the story goes, Hera caused Hercules so much trouble that he was actually driven mad on one occasion. According to Homer, just before Hercules was born, Zeus announced a prophecy that would make Hercules the ruler of the heavens in his place when the time came. Hera didn't like that so much. She kind of pushed the birth thing a little bit. Hera also made Herc crazy. A little bit of roid rage, you know? In a blind rage one night, he kills his wife and son under the rage spell of Hera. Part of this punishment was that the insanity was just temporary, so when he came to and realized that he John Wicked everyone, yeah, she had won. In sadness, he smashed about 12 labors and got himself back on track. Talk about zero to hero. Number four, Arachne and Athena. Okay, so a little hex here, a little labors there. The wrath of the gods is pretty tame so far. Well, was. And then there's the story of Arachne. Ovid recounts the very talented mortal Arachne, daughter of Idmon, challenged Athena, goddess of wisdom and crafts, to a weaving contest. Yeah, you don't challenge the goats to what make them great, you know? When Athena could find no flaws or errors in the tapestry, she was pretty pissed. When Athena saw that Arachne had not only insulted the gods in what she had drawn, but done so with a work far more beautiful than Athena's own art, she was enraged. She ripped Arachne's work to shreds, and terrified of what comes next, Arachne took her own life. Athena brought her back to life, cursing her after a little sprinkle of Hecate's herb, an ancient poison. Arachne's hair started falling out, and then her nose fell off, and then her fingers, as her whole body started slowly turning into a giant spider. Uh? And this is apparently now why we have spiders. Yeah, thanks to this epic weave off. Number three, Jailhouse King. So eventually people in the Ottoman Empire were not okay with brothers impersonating Abel and Cain. After all, this bloodshed is rather pointless. There's gotta be a better way to choose the next ruler of this empire and still keep everyone alive. How about house arrest? The solution to solve the next heir and to have brothers not be unalive was to keep them in cafes. No, not coffee shops. Lavish prisons for princes, to be exact. Cafe literally translates to cage, and it's where the heir spent their time locked up away, safe from harm. Not allowed to leave, but allowed to have female visitation if you catch my drift. It sounds like a good idea, but locking up somebody for long periods of time then expecting that person to rule a country that they barely know or seen is kind of messed up. Also, no streaming services and Wi-Fi would make that the worst day ever. I give them this place two stars, man. Number two, impressive run. Okay, yeah, the Ottomans did some messed up stuff. I called the chief again last night, and he said it wasn't it. But that goes for all civilizations of the past. What's really messed up, though, is how long the Ottoman Empire lasted. From medieval times to the earliest 20th century, which is pretty close to the modern era. Over 600 years of conquering the Balkans, Middle East, North Africa, and the Caucasus. Like I've said before, you don't get that big and powerful without breaking a few eggs to make your omelets along the way. I am generalizing, but the Ottoman Empire was one of the most powerful empires to ever exist, and one of the longest. Encompassing roughly 20 million square kilometers at its peak, had a population of 35 million citizens. Number one, a man you can trust. Okay, so room full of scantily clad women has to be protected, right? I mean, come on, who's gonna help? You need someone strong, obviously, but you also need somebody you can trust. Someone who will not fall for their devilishly good looks and try to take one of those wives away from your harem. Good thing the Ottomans had eunuchs on speed dial, or rather just had a lot from pillaging other nations and just kind of kept, kept them around. But as silly as it might sound, it does make sense. How could a man be tempted to bed with a woman if he's missing his long John Silver? Right? Number 10, the sins of our fathers. Law and Order is not just a hit drama from the 90s with a killer soundtrack but something that started with the civilizations a very long time ago. King Hammurabi and his code of law comes to mind. But today, we're talking about ancient Persia. We're talking about a corrupt judge named Sisimans. After taking a bribe and delivering a not so unbiased verdict, 
The king found out and was most displeased. This is one of the worst things to do to another human being, but poor Sisamese was flayed. Or in simpler terms, they done skin that feather alive. To make an unholy situation even more uncomfortable, they made a chair and used his hide as a material and made his son sit in the flesh chair to make his own judgments. Can't help but think that you'd be sitting there all day thinking of dear old dad because you're sitting on top of a chair that's kind of fuzzy because dad had a lot of back hair. Yikes. Number nine, the annual purge. I don't know about you folks at home, but I love the holiday season. For me specifically, Christmas. And to me, the meaning of Christmas is something less to do with religious background, but just good cheer. Spending time with loved ones and friends and really enjoying a nice homemade meal. I mean, come on, turkey with a stuffing. <laughs> can't go wrong there. And honestly, you can't beat a good stuffing. I love it. But looking back at ancient Persia, there was a different kind of holiday. One that also has its roots in uh, less about religion and more about cold-blooded killings. There were Zoroastrian priests called the Magi, and although they weren't Persian, they were somewhat respected in Persian culture. But when a plot to overthrow the king was enacted, the Persians were not too happy, and slaughtered the people responsible for the coup. But just for good measure, they also slaughtered all the other priests in the palace. Okay, but they might have missed some outside in the city and they had to get them too. You know what, how about every year on this day we go on a magi hunt? So it became a holiday. Every year on the day of the coup, there was a grand feast and then a hunt for the remaining survivors. That's really comforting, that's nice. Number eight, poaching. It's 2021, we all know it's super uncool to poach. Illegally hunting endangered species for fun or just one sought after piece of the animal like elephant tusks for ivory. Our Persian friends of the past just might have been partaking in the poaching of rhinos. While in the ancient world the laws of today were not around to protect animals, the reason was still there and people wanted horns. For some reason, however, people thought that rhino horn held the power to purify water. Thus, it was used to detect poisonous liquids. It's a superstitious belief that actually would be carried on for a very long time. Rhino horn did have other uses in civilizations, but I like to think it was a coolness factor. You can't tell me drinking wine out of a hollowed out horn isn't cool, come on. Right? Number seven, the air factory. Now this makes sense when you think about it. Ottomans had siblings duking it out in the streets and cradles because of harems. Relax, late night users of the internet, it's a little bit different than what you think that means. Okay, yes, it was a room full of women and ladies of the evening, but these women actually held some political power. An example of this is an extremely influential time for these women that became to be known as the Sultanate of Women. Mothers of sultans often and help choose women for their sons, which I'm sure is the worst blind date ever, and once the women were pregnant, they were no longer permitted to be with the Sultan. That child, if born a son, would take a position with his mother in governing a province. There's a lot of rules to this thing, and pretty messed up, but I think if there's something to take away from this, like we should do with all history really, is when you make the succession of your country messy, the politics get messy, and when that happens, you're at the risk of revolution. Number six. Classic humanity. Here I am again talking about YouTube's least favorite S word. I'm here to give you the buzz in history. And that's just how it goes. Probably the worst invention that we've ever come up with since war, but alas, it happened, and it happened in the Ottoman Empire too. It was pretty easy to get rich off the backs of those you whip. What's so messed up is how long it lasted. I'll give you a second to figure out how long. Go ahead, go ahead. Guess what year it ended in? 1908. Yeah, they kept it going until 1908. While the anti-S word movement had done their best to remove this heinous activity, it is speculated that it continued up until the 1930s, specifically the trade and sale of women for the deed of deeds. Now you know something's messed up when that outlives your empire. The Ottoman Empire was dissolved shortly after this during the First World War. Number five, Semper Fi. Okay, you've traveled back in time, you said to yourself, hey, I played tons of video games. I love ancient civilizations. I too wish to be a part of amassing army where we will vanquish our foes and gallantly fought battles. Once we reign victorious, we shall celebrate with a feast of grandeur and wine to soak our troubled souls. I am so pleased with the display of the enemy's blood that I am not even going to bathe for a week. Oh, the contrary, my chivalry late night gamers. The Ottomans were quite the opposite. The Janissaries were an elite force, but the officers in the military had very strict rules. When setting up camps, there was to be no consumption of alcohol. A strict rationing and sanitation was to be very important. You'd think how tough being an army like that would be? How far a little rest and relaxation will go. Come on, lighten up, guys. Number four, the rifle or the pen. When the Ottomans had taken Constantinople, it was treated as an absolute win. And for the Ottomans, it kind of was. 
For every Christian still in the city, not so much. A lot of them were killed or sold into the situation that Anakin Skywalker left Tatooine for. As their empire grew, they began to take children at a young age. And when I say take, I mean take kids that weren't exactly theirs who take in the first place and convert them to Islam. And give them two choices. You're either a politician or you're going to be a soldier. The politicians surprisingly reached some higher levels of power. but. Now, if this were me, I know I'd end up in the army. I was never too bright. This actually kind of makes sense though. The idea was to create an army of completely loyal soldiers to the Sultan and government bodies that everyone could trust. Cruel, but effective. Number 3. Here comes the boy. So after a failed attack on Greece, Persia was kind of down about that. No money in the treasury meant that the once great Persian empire was on the decline. So what better time to invade? And that's just what Alexander the Great did. Through a very lengthy campaign that lasted 10 years and a very formidable fighting force, most likely the strongest ever at the time, he shattered the declining Persian Empire. He even managed to capture the city of Babylon. Talk about kicking a guy while he's down. His rule of the Persian Empire unfortunately was short lived, as he died not too long after that at the ripe old age of 32. Boy, I sure hope I lived to the ripe age of 32. Number 2. The protection of Meow. Before the Persian Empire was no more, they were actually a very powerful empire. So powerful that they wanted a piece of Egypt. This war may have also been started by an insult from the pharaoh, but expanding was probably more likely. What makes this war so notable is the absolute five head play by Persia. Persia knew of the Egyptian culture and knew about their idolization of cats. So, to aid them in the invasion, the king advised them to use kitty power. Soldiers were painting cats in the god Bastet in order for Egyptians to not dare destroy an image of their god. More ridiculous than that was the use of live cats. Stray cats were rounded up and kept during battle in order to prevent the very lethal arrow fire. Soldiers still died in battle, but it is said that the cats gave enough of an advantage for there to be a Persian victory. Decent. Number 1. Progressive for the time. Looking back in time, we can all acknowledge that maybe we weren't so nice. And as time has moved on, we've gotten more progressive. When you think of ancient empires, you don't really think of progressive, but surprisingly Persia was for the time. Specifically women's rights. Women were free to move about. They were allowed to work and be higher ups and manage. But probably the most important aspect was the right to own business and property, which their European counterparts simply could not do. Look at you Asian Persia, way to go, look at you. Number 10. Aphrodite and Lemnos. Kicking off this list we have some pretty tame punishments. Definitely cruel to say the least, but more on the non-lethal side of things, as God's sakes go. Apparently the gods love to be praised. Yeah, they're uh, awesome. <laughs> but sometimes they do some foul stuff. The goddess of beauty herself, Aphrodite, gets pretty pissed when she's not obsessed over. And the women of the Isle of Lemnos were kind of slacking on the prayer department. So she cursed the people of the island with a foul smell. I mean, that's pretty mean. Everybody stinks sometimes in life. You know, it's life. Little Musk never hurt anybody. But apparently the stink was so bad, all their partners left them and they were quite upset. Bruh. Which I can understand. It was probably just the equivalent to like the great stink in Europe, you know? Bodies and carcasses on a hot, grease day just heating up the water and stinking it up. But nope, now it's a curse. Poor women of Lemnos probably get that rep for a while, you know? Stereotypes, they're brutal. I don't like them. Also, a little salt water under the armpits, boom, easy fix. Number 9. Demeter and Ascalophus. Demeter, goddess of harvest and agriculture, and her hatred for a certain mortal man. A, a king, actually. Demeter apparently was out looking for her abducted daughter Persephone and was thirsty from running around, naturally. She found a cottage owned by a little old lady named Hecuba asking to wet her whistle and started drinking some barley juice. Thirsty as all Poseidon, she was chugging from all the running around. The son of the woman, just a little kid, basically was like, thirsty much? <laughs> yeah, you don't mock a god, no man. She threw her drink in his face and turned him immediately into a spotted newt. <laughs> You're done. You're done. <laughs> Okay, couple things here. Little excessive, I think. I mean, <laughs> what do I know? I guess you shouldn't talk sh kid, you know? Talk shit, get turned into a newt. That's the saying, isn't it? Number eight, Demeter and Erisithen. Erisithen of Thessaly ordered all of the trees of the sacred grove of Demeter to be cut down. Yeah, that's a big mistake right there. 
Industrial logging. One huge oak was covered with beautiful wreaths, a symbol of every prayer Demeter had ever granted, and so the men refused to cut it down. Every other one, of course, yeah, let's go get that rustic log cabin look. Erisythen needed more wood, so he himself grabbed an axe and went out and cut down that last tree. He was cursed by a nymph, naturally, whose prayer had been heard by Demeter herself. Long story short, she was like, you wanna build and eat? No problem. Gave him the munchies of a lifetime. Non-stop hunger. An insatiable hunger. Guy ate everything in sight. He was so hungry, Guy started eating himself. Yeah, all of him. Look, I've been hungry and picked something off the floor, five second rule, no problem. But I've never garlic and buttered my own fingers. But uh, greed is greed, firm but fair. Number seven, Marvin's room. Hey man, it's okay. We've all been there. We all felt that kind of hurt before. You're drunk, it's 3 a.m. in a big city with lights. She hurt you bad, dude. But you should just call her. Just see if she picks up. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should get really drunk and then come up with a solution and then see if it still sounds like a solid plan in the morning when you're sober. Yeah, when ancient Persians had a big decision to make, they used dad wisdom. Get super drunk and then think about critical events in life that require tough decision making. And when you're sober in the morning, do it drunk you thought. Being honest was a big part of Persian culture. And when are people at their most honest? So the theory kind of makes sense to me. I just know that when I wake up in the morning after nurturing a case of beer, that last night's thoughts don't always translate well in the morning. Number six, the land of milk and honey. Another creative punishment for the people who want to lose sleep tonight, a punishment for crimes Persians had come up with was scapism. This is where the Persians would feed a convicted criminal milk and honey. Sounds awesome, right? Well, not exactly. See, they entrap the person between two boats. And every day, they would force feed someone milk and honey. Milk and honey, milk and honey. Over and over and over again. Also, slathering the mixture of the two on the poor helpless criminal. As time went on, flies and bugs would find themselves interested in a sweet smelling crook. As one must also use the bathroom after all that beautiful rich consumption. A true horror to see, but after enough time, the person who was unlucky enough to be in such a position slowly and painfully died in a bog of their own filth and rodent infested area. Most likely dying of septic shock. I don't even have a joke for this one. This is something that should just be in the next Saw movie. Ugh. Number five, ashes to ashes. Here's another fun punishment. Man, these guys are really creative. This one is mentioned in the Bible, so you know it's gonna be good. Basically, the Persians built a tower, and it was filled with ash. Drop criminals into the ash tower, or there were two large paddles connected to the turning wheels outside that would churn the ash and victim inside, suffocating on the hot ash. Making for a hot and dusty storm of hell and unholy foulness I can't even begin to describe. Like most things in history from this time, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. It could be very true, or not so true. As the Persian Empire did not leave us with much, and most knowledge of them comes from Greeks and Greek historians. But like most stories, there's truth in everything. And if that's even close to the truth, well, that's just not right, man. Number four, this is Sparta. Despite what a 2006 movie with spray on abs might mislead you, the Battle of Thermopylae was no laughing matter. It pitted the very brave Spartans against the Persian invaders. And there were a lot of them. Like, really a lot of them. Attack after attack after attack, the Persians were not getting anywhere. It wasn't until one of the Greeks betrayed the Spartans by leaving the Persians on a flank that would result in the destruction of the Spartans. Although the Persians were victorious, it was in a sense a Pyrrhic victory, as the loss of life on the Persian side far outnumbered the deaths of the Spartans. It's a battle that would be remembered for its bravery, and enough to have a movie made about it many, many years later. Number three. Hera and Lamia. Lamia was a beautiful Libyan queen and enter Zeus stage right. Of course, loved by Zeus. Yeah, basically through no fault of her own, she got the wrath of Hera upon herself. This dude's commitment skills leads these people to get in a line of fire with some nasty curses. Hera cursed this lady hard. Every time she gave birth to a child, Hera either murdered it or made her eat it, regardless if it was Zeus's or not. Hera was like, Nah, never again, now eat it. All of them. Even babies that weren't hers. Basically every night Lamia would ravenously make her way village to village eating mother's babies. That's horrible. She swore to bereave all mothers of their children just as she had been once by Hera. Trying to help of course, Zeus gave her removable eyes so that she was blind but harmless in the day, but after she popped those bad boys in, feeding time. Hera's mean man. Number two, 
Poseidon and Pasiphae. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more into like disturbing graphic land with some of the more cruel things here. What started out as a rumor that some people were kind of smelly is turning into like eternities of pain and suffering and stuff. Pasiphae was a queen of Crete and often regarded as the goddess of witchcraft and sorcery. The daughter of Helios and the ocean nymph Perse, Pasiphae is notable as the mother of the Minotaur. You'll see why. She conceived the Minotaur after mating with the Cretan bull. Minos was required to sacrifice the fairest bull to Poseidon each year. One year, Minos, king, refused to sacrifice his most beautiful strong bull and sacrificed an inferior weak bull instead. Dude, don't with the gods. As punishment, of course, Poseidon then cursed his wife Pasiphae to fall head over heels obsession lust for this beautiful giant prized bull. And many months later, Pasiphae gave birth to a half human half bull creature famously known as the Minotaur. The curse was sent out as a reminder to her husband Minos, quality over quantity kind of deal. That's heartbreaking. For her, of course. Her husband's cheap, so she has to birth a bull. It's not really fair, I'd say. And coming in at number one, Prometheus and Zeus. And our number one spot, of course, must go to the god of gods himself. He can be pretty shady. Cheating on all his lovers, fighting with his old man and his kids. He's a little unpredictable at times. This one, ramping up the cruelty, we have Prometheus. He was our guy. This demigod loved us and stole fire for us. He fought on our behalf. He led the titans into a trap, securing power amongst the gods again. He was everybody's friend, besides Zeus. Yeah, Zeus didn't like the tricks and the new plans and all the attention he was getting. So Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining the titan god to a rock with the might of Zeus himself. And then, worst part of course, having an eagle day in and day out just eat his insides out. Basically just slowly eating him for eternity. He would heal overnight, but then come the AM, breakfast again for eternity. Okay, so a little humanity never hurt anybody except for poor Prometheus. Thank you for the wonderful campfires. We now have s'mores, they taste great. But Hercules is coming, buddy. He's gonna come save you. I've seen the last chapter, no spoilers alert. 